So turn to the book of Haggai, chapter 2. That's where we're going to be this morning. And uh, continuing in through our series in Haggai, next Sunday we'll finish it up. But we talked about last week how Haggai ends the book basically sharing three messages. And so we hit the first one last week where he's calling the people to look up, remember God's covenant, remember God's promise. Today, he's calling the people to look within. So we're going to talk about that for just a minute, but as we're, as we're setting this up, I was, I was thinking about, because what Haggai really does here in this passage, in these verses 10 through 19, is he really asks the priest, and in asking the priest, he's really asking the people two questions. Two questions. And, and as I was thinking about that this week, I, I was thinking about how most of us, and I want, to, I want to do a show of hands, I want to do a show of hands in the room, and if you're watching this online later, do this with us, right? But how, how many of you would say that I've got more questions right now than I do answers? How many of you? I'm raising my hand. I've got more questions right now than I do answers, okay? Some of, some, some of the guys there right there, some of, the, some of the students back there, they've got more answers than questions. They didn't raise their hand. I, that makes sense to me, okay? That makes sense. I've got a couple of those in my house right now as well. They've got all the answers, right? No questions. I'm just kidding, guys. It's good to see you. I'm glad to have you back. Um, but uh, um, many of us would say, right, if we're honest with ourselves, we've got more questions right now than we do answers, and what do we do with these questions? How do we answer these questions? And, and what information do I trust? And what, what, where, where, what platforms and what places can I turn to for answers? And as I was driving in this morning, thinking about this and kind of thinking about the, the opening of the message and, and stuff like that and, and, and how we're taken off into this message. Because let me tell you something. In all the book of Haggai, this message is probably the hardest one to preach and the hardest one to hear. The hardest one to receive for us today. There are some, there's some, there's some heavy things here that Haggai says to the people that are rebuilding the temple. And I felt like this morning, God just whispered to me, listen, if you have more questions, you have more answers. Because in your questioning, you can find your dependence on me. Think about that, right? I mean, all throughout Scripture, especially if we think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Gospels, and Jesus, right? Jesus responds to every person either with a question or a story. I mean, Jesus asked questions, right? And, 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 and all throughout Scripture, we look at Moses, we look at Joshua, we look at all of, all of the great people in Scripture, and, 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 and it's full of questions. It's full of questions. And I felt like God said this morning that if you've got questions... You're in the right place for me to use you. Because you need me. Because you need me. Because you need me. The question for us today, I think, is where are we taking our questions? Right? Where are we taking our questions? And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. That's what I believe Haggai talks quite a bit about in the book of Haggai chapter 2. So we're going to read it. Uh, verses 10 through 19, it'll be on the screen. And, and let me just tell you once again um, that, 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 that there's a lot here. And so I want to I give us the context. I want to read the passage. I want to talk about it, kind of go verse by verse, talk about the, the questions that Haggai asks, try to explain those to the best of our ability. And then at the end, we're going to pull some a life application out that we, can, that we can apply. And I believe there's a call that God wants to give each and every one of us this morning. Okay, you ready? You ready? You with me? Bruce gave me a thumbs up. All right, so we're ready. We're ready. Man, there, a couple of y'all, a couple of y'all families weren't here last week. It's good to have you back. It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Uh, don't fall asleep now. Okay. All right, Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by the Haggai, the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Yes. 
Then verse 14, Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with these people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands and what they offer, there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Verse 18, consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, verse 19, underline this, highlight a start, you may not get it yet, but hopefully by the end of this you'll get it, and verse 19 will be groundbreaking for you, is the seed yet in the barn, indeed the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. So a couple things about this message that Haggai is sharing here. It's about two months later than the message that we looked at last week. God spoke to Haggai again and gave him a message about, you ready for this? Dot, 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 sin. This message is about sin, right? And I know what some of you are thinking, yes, woke up July 19th. Beautiful, sunshiny day, and I can't wait to get to church this morning. I hope we preach a message on sin, right? Something we all love to talk about, something we all love to think about, right? Here's my worry for us, that so many of us aren't dealing with our sin because we've just become numb to it. And I hope we see today that it's a real issue. It's a real issue. I think, I think I shared this in an earlier message through, through quarantine. But there was a moment, there was a moment in quarantine, you know, where like, and, and let's, let's be honest about it, like for some of us, th- this was a godsend to stop. Now, now some people couldn't stop, right? Some, some, some schedules got even crazier. Some, people, some people's schedules got even busier. But, but, for, but for a lot of people, you know, you, you, you work from home, transition to, to home, kids, kids were in school. The running, you know, the sports stopped. Running, running people from place to place to place and being the glorified taxi driver that all parents are, right? That was kind of put on pause. And, and, and I, I, remember, I remember sitting and thinking about, about some things and feeling very deeply for the first time in a long time. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what is this? And you know what was happening? I didn't have my busy schedule and the running from place to place to place to place to numb things anymore. I was feeling some things for the first time in a long time. That wasn't the most pleasant thing on the planet, but oh, was it needed? See, I think so many. I think so many of us fall into the trap of just numbing ourselves with, with, with routine, numbing ourselves with busyness, numbing ourselves with schedules, numbing ourselves with the relationships, so that we don't have to feel the effects. That was free. So Haggai brings a message about sin. God couldn't bless the people the way that he wanted because they were defiled. They were unclean. So it was important that they keep themselves clean before the Lord. See, clean and unclean, follow me here, clean and unclean, they were very important concepts to the Jews living under the old covenant. This was a major theme. This was a major theme in the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. If a Jew became defiled, unclean, right, perhaps by touching a dead body, touching an open sore, then he was separated from the rest and required to bathe before being allowed to return with the rest of the group. In some cases, they would have been required to offer a sacrifice to restore fellowship with the Lord. Now, we even saw this last week in the, in the, in the New Testament with Jesus in Luke 11, right, when the Pharisee invited them to the house. The Pharisee was shocked that Jesus didn't clean himself before coming to the house and reclining at his table, right? And what did Jesus say? 
You're worried about me being unclean on the outside, but yet you're unclean on the inside. Jesus cared about the heart, right? And, and see, we know, we know, we have the benefit here of knowing the end of the story, knowing that Jesus came on and, and shook everything. Right? And so we didn't have to go through these processes. We didn't have to go through these cleansing because Jesus, His blood washes us white as snow, cleansed us. But yet we've still got to talk about our heart. We've still got a sin issue that we've got to talk about. So this would have been a major theme for these Jews. They would have heard about a clean, unclean, old covenant, right? And Haggai goes to the priests, who were the authorities on the subject of sin, and asks them two questions. Now, the questions he asked them, they weren't for his own education, right? Because he knew the law. They were the, for the benefit of the people who were present. They were for the benefit of the people who were present. Parents do this all the time, right? Don't we, parents? Right? We ask questions that aren't necessarily for our knowledge because we know the answer, but they're for the people's knowledge in the room. Like this past week, pouring down rain outside. We had a couple amazing rainstorms, right? And pouring down rain outside, walked over to the window, looking outside and saying, hmm, you think those pool towels are doing any good sitting outside in the rain? Oh, I know the answer to that. Right? I know the answer to that. But it was for the benefit of some of the people that may or may not have been in the room to think about whether or not it was wise for their pool towel to be out serving the purpose of soaking up the rain. Right? You following me? You tracking me? And that's what Haggai was doing here, right? He's asking questions, not because he needed the answer. He knew the law, but he was asking for the benefit of the people that were hearing. All right, let's look at the questions. All right, let's look at the questions. The first one comes from verses 11 and 12, where Haggai says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his full bread or stew or wine or any oil or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? See, here's the truth. When an animal was presented on the altar as a sacrifice, the meat that was there was considered holy. That is, that it belonged to God. Now get this, set apart to be used only, somebody say only, only, these guys are tracking, somebody say only, only, okay, only as God intended, okay, only as God instructed, okay, this meat that was set on the altar as a sacrifice was to be used and set apart only as God instructed. The priests and their families, they were permitted to eat portions of some of the sacrifices, but they had to be careful how they ate it. Right? Where they ate it and what they did with the leftovers. There were there was there was covenant, there were rules and, and, and ceremonies all on this stuff. And so Haggai says, if a garment, a holy garment containing a piece of meat touches food, does the garment make the food holy? And the answer is no. The priest says no. It's, it's un, they, they, they say no. They're, the priest answered and said, No, at the end of verse. 12. Why? Really important. Because you can't share holiness in such a manner. The first question that Haggai asked them was a question on holiness. You can't share righteousness in such a manner. You can't share holiness in such a way. Even though the garment is set apart as holy because of the sanctified meat, holiness can't be shared to other objects by the garment. This will make more sense as we talk about question number two. Look at verse 13. Then Haggai said, if somebody who is unclean by contact with the dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. So suppose, suppose somebody touched a dead body and became unclean, Haggai said. Could that person touch another person and make them unclean? The answer was obviously yes. Haggai had to make this point. You can share defilement from one thing or person to another, but you can't share holiness. You can make something you, you as unclean, right? You can make something else unclean, but you can't share holiness. The same principle applies in 
health. Interesting thing to talk about right now, but let's talk about it because it'll be pretty applicable for all of us, right? You can transmit, right? You can share. Sharing is caring, not always. You can share your sickness to healthy people and make them sick, right? I.e., masks, right? You can share your sickness to healthy people and make them sick, but you can't share your health with them. You can't share your health with them, right? There's a, there's a way I love to illustrate this, but I can't illustrate it right now because we can't illustrate it and remain socially distant, okay? But if I asked John to come up here and stand on this stool, right? Act of faith, he'd stand on the stool, right? And if I were to grab John by the arm, Bruce, how easy do you think it'd be for me to pull John off that stool onto the floor? Pretty easy, right? Pretty easy. I mean, I'm... Buff. Right? They're, they're in there. Somewhere. Right? But let's flip it. Say he was standing on that stool. And I said, hey, I would like to be up on the stool with you. Let's see if we can play a game. Let's see if we can both stand up there. Why don't you pick me up onto that stool with you? Could he do it? No. Not a chance. I know what I ate this past week. Right? What's the point? It's easier to pull somebody down than it is to pick them up. And that's what Haggai was sharing here with the people. He was asking, right? He says, he says you, you can share sickness. You can share sin. You can defile others by your uncleanliness. But your holiness, you can't share. How many parents have you talked to? I used to be a student pastor, right? I had a bunch of students in my youth group. And, my, and, and parents would come to me and say, listen, I'm just trying to get my kid into your youth group. If they just would show up, if they would just get into the four walls, right? Things would happen for them, right? How many parents, right, just think, if I can just get my kids into the four walls. But yet, no change ever happens. Why? Because it doesn't work like that. There's got to be a heart change. There's got to be a heart shift. God's got to meet them. There's got to be, right? There's got to be a work of God there. It's not enough just to, 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 to show up. Things don't rub off that way. Right? So what's Haggai driving at here with these questions, with these points? The people had to be asking that question. Right? The people had to be, be thinking, the priests had to be thinking, Haggai, what are you getting at here? What are you talking about? Right? What are you talking about? Here's the point. Here's the application. The people working on the temple couldn't impart any holiness to it. But they could defile it by their sins. That's the second question, right? The first question was the question of holiness. The second question was the question of defilement, uncleanliness. They could defile it by their sins. Not only was it important that they do God's work, but it was also important that they do His work from hearts that were pure and devoted to God. And what Haggai was doing here in verses 10 through 19 is he's issuing a call to the Jews of repentance. Of repentance. He's saying, listen, turn Right? Turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your uncleanliness. Turn from the stuff that trips you up. And turn to God. But with that call came the assurance of God's blessing. If you look there at verse 19, right? As the seed yet in the barn, indeed the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing. You want to know how you can, you want to know how you can um, um, see, right? What, where a person's heart is? Where's their fruit? So like I got saying, they, they've yielded nothing. There's no fruit. But if you turn, right? This day, from this day on, I will bless you. So it's a call to repentance that came with the assurance of God's blessing. From this day on, I will 
bless you. And what Haggai was doing here is fascinating. You remember last week when he gave his first message, he was giving it, right, at, at, the, at the feast, right? Why was that important? Because it was the same time that the original temple, right, was dedicated to the Lord. It was the original, it was the original time. Here, right, he's bringing this message, stirring in them a reminder of the promise that God gave Solomon after the dedication of the temple. The promise that God gave Solomon after the dedication of the original temple, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Did you catch that? That is the promise that God gave Solomon after the original dedication of the temple. And what do we see from Haggai's words? The same call. Right? Almost identical. A call to repentance. What, what, what's Solomon hearing here from the Lord? If my people, if... Somebody say if. If. Wow, more of you woke up. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And here it is. Turn from their wicked ways. Repent of their sin. I will hear from heaven. And forgive their sins. And heal their land. The same promise that God Give Solomon at the original temple is the same place Haggai's calling when they're rebuilding the temple, preparing it for Jesus, preparing it for the day, right? And what Haggai's saying is, listen, there's no room for uncleanliness here. There's no room for uncleanliness. Jesus is going to walk up here. He's going to flip tables. Jesus is going to come in here. People are going to people are going to find eternal life in this temple. There's no place for defilement. There's no place for uncleanliness. There's no place for wickedness. There's no place for that here. There's no place for that in the house of God, in the temple. The same call, the same call of God on Solomon, the same call of God through Haggai to the Jews rebuilding the temple. Whoa, the same call today. If my people, the church of Jesus, who are called by God's name, would pray and seek His face and turn from their wicked ways, repent. I will hear from heaven. Forgive their sin. And heal their land. Can somebody say amen, church? Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want that? In the midst of all the questions, all the chaos, and listen, I'm not, I'm not getting into it. I'm not getting into it. My heart grieves, though. My heart grieves. I know I'm gonna get an email about this. We're driving in the car on Friday up to up to Res to get 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 a lobster roll the size of Texas, and. And I don't even know where she'd seen this, but my 10-year-old asks from the third row, Mommy, Daddy, why are people destroying history? Why are they tearing it down? And I'll, I'll, be, I'll be straight up honest with you. I didn't know how to answer. Bruce, I mean, I'm up there in the front seat, like, grieved in my heart that my 10 year old's, like, looking at the world with questions. But 
Does that not break our hearts? Oh God, like, come. Intervene here. Do something. And he promised he would. If my people who are called by my name, I'm, 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 I'm that. I fit that. You fit that? I fit that. If my people, if my people who are called by my name, I don't know about you, church, but that's me. I fit that category. Would pray. Okay, we got to pray, church. We got to pray. We got to pray. And we got to seek his face. Come on now. Come on. Y'all hear me this morning? If my people who are called by my name would pray and seek my face. And here's where it hurts. Here's where it gets sticky. Here's where it gets hard. Here's where it hits right home for us. Would turn from their wicked ways. Okay, God, I got to do some heart work because I know, I know there's some things boiling up inside of me that don't please you. I know there's some thoughts that don't please you. I know there's some unforgiveness and maybe some bitterness that don't please you. I know there's some stuff in here that God, I've got to turn from. I've got to lay at your altar and repentance says, you lay it there and you turn and you walk away you don't look back I know God that there's some stuff in me that I've got to do that with I've got to lay it there I've got to put it there I've got to put my questions and my confusion and my not my stuff there and I've got to turn from it and I've got to walk away from it then God says I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I'll heal their land is it alright if I preach this morning? I think I just did, so I don't think you have a choice. Listen, listen, listen. For far too long, church, I wish this would have been the live stream. For far too long, church, for far too long, church, for far too long, we've treated the house of God like a game. You've got the small percentage of people out there playing the game. You've got more people in the stands eating popcorn and drinking soda. They're saying, oh, isn't that cute? They're tackling each other down there. They're battling it out. Oh, the good guys won today. Oh, the bad guys, those dolphins, they won today. People in the stands, they really don't care about the win or the loss. They're there for the entertainment of it. Right? I mean, that's why I go to a game. That's why I watch a game. That's why I watch most of my games at home because I'm more comfortable. I'm more cozy. I'm more entertained. Talk about that in a church platform today. It's more comfortable to watch church at home for some... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, we're getting too deep for far too long. And listen to me, church. Listen to me, church. Hear my heart. Hear my heart. Hear my heart. I'm not saying these things for shock effect. I'm not saying these things just to, just to, just to stir emotion, okay, in you. I'm not saying these things so that you'll send me an email, okay, rebuking me. Listen to me. I'm, I'm saying these things. I'm saying these things because I believe that the church is on the verge of a wake-up call if His people will respond in repentance. If to me, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it's the biggest word in that verse. If, if, if my people who are called by my name will respond. Repent. Seek my face. I'll hear from heaven. What's he say there? Humble themselves. Look at Philippians chapter 2. I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time, but I, I got to talk about this. Philippians chapter 2, God put this on my heart. Verse 1. 
Um, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, Paul's saying to the church of Philippi, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What's Paul doing here with the church of Philippi? He's calling them to unity around the things of God. He's calling them to unity. So here it is, is this way, Summit Church, July 19th, 2020. I know some of you just, when I said 2020, your, your face just sank because you're wishing for 2019 or hoping for 2021. Okay, I get it. I get it. We're almost there. All right, we're almost there to a turn, hopefully, right? Um, but, but, but listen, he's calling the church to unity. In July 19th, 2020, Summit Church, listen, we're being called to unity right now. We're being called to unity around these things right now. Do nothing. I don't know about you, but I wish Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 could be a theme verse for the Church of America right now. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let me read that one more time. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Then he goes into the mind of Christ, talking about the mind of Christ. Have this mind that is yours in Christ Jesus. Very similar to Ephesians 5. One, imitate Christ, therefore, as his dear children. You can look at the mind of Christ if you want a fascinating Bible study this week. Just look at Philippians chapter 2 and study the mind of Christ. But here's the point. Consistent with Haggai, consistent with Second Chronicles, nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. I know some of you have heard the definition, but I've got to share it again because we've got to talk about this word humility because it's so consistent here when it comes to repentance. Humility is defined as an accurate view of myself directly related to the high view of God. Okay? So when I have a high view of God, right, seek my face, Second Chronicles 7, Haggai, right? Uh, not being defiled, right? Not being defiled. No fruit, but I will bless you if you will seek me. If you will seek me with your heart and deal with your uncleanliness. All right? Okay? So, so we see that high view of God, high view of God, seeking after God directly, excuse me, producing in me an accurate view of myself. Who am I? Sinner. in need of a Savior. In need of depending on God with everything I've got. Because God's going to either change the situation or He's going to change my perspective. So God can either heal and change the situation that we've got in our hands um, with, with COVID, with our country, with racial injustice, with all of these different things, or He can change my perspective to it and call me to, call, call me to join the fight. Of, 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 and, and, and by fight, I don't mean, right? I mean, I mean listening, right? Right? The spiritual fight. Our call today, summit, is a call to humility, to repentance. And here's something I'd like to deal with in closing. Because for far too long, it's been used as a free sin pass. I was playing church softball one time down in North Carolina, which y'all know what church softball is, right? It's for all the people that aren't good enough to play in the real softball league i.e. this guy, right? So, so, so playing church softball, and I was on the staff at the church, and so it was kind of like, you know, go play, and our senior pastor was our coach, and all that. And we're playing a church softball game. One night we're playing the best team in the league, team that's won like 10, 10 championships in a row, and we get crushed. 
crushed. I mean, we get crushed. A lot to a little. I think it was actually a lot to nothing. I mean, these guys get get up there and they just bunt the ball over the fence in the outfield for a home run. I mean, it's just it's sad. It's defeating. But what happened about the second or third inning is they were starting to have a lot of fun with their victory. And man, they started name calling. They started like, like just, I mean, saying things that I didn't expect to hear on a church softball field. A church softball field, right? Now, I know, I know, right? I'm not sheltered. I play basketball. I get it, right? I get it. But it, was, it just got to be too much, Bruce. And so we're shaking hands at the end of the game. This was way back when you could do that. And we're in the, we're in the handshaking line and stuff like that. And I, I went to the team captain who was one of the pastors at the church. I was like, hey, man, can you guys check your like language and how you talk to other teams? I mean, you guys are clearly the best team in the league. We're just out here trying to have fun and enjoy each other. And he turned around and looked at me, gave me the smuggest grin. Like, Mark, if I wouldn't have been on staff at the church, buddy, I might have gone Ninja Turtles on him and shown him my nunchuck skills. But like, he gave me the smuggest grin and looked at me. He's like, we're all sinners. Oh, <laughs> buddy. How many of us do that? I know I've done that. Our sin, which sin is anything that separates us from God. That grieves God's spirit. It says so in Scripture. Yet it doesn't grieve us. Well, it's okay. We're all sinners. And while that's true, and while we'll never attain perfection, Haggai was getting at to the Jews and God through Solomon was getting at at the original temple. Jesus, Paul, all of Scripture is what I want to ask you in closing. How's your heart towards that that separates you from God? Paul described it as a thorn in the flesh. This thorn in the flesh. That doesn't sound like it was something he was comfortable with. So as we pray this morning, we're going to sing a song. It's called Give Me Faith. The bridge of the song says, I know I'm weak but your spirit's strong in me. Can I ask you to pray that prayer this morning? Say, God, I'm weak. I am a sinner. For some of us this morning, we, we may need to ask, God, would you convict me of that which grieves you? I don't want it to. I don't want to defile the house. I want to seek your face. Would you heal this land as a result of my repentance? Our repentance. God, this morning,
God, this morning I thank You that You're faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. God, I pray for the boldness for some of us to grieve over that which grieves You. And God, it may not be quote-unquote big things in our eyes. God, there, there may be some anger, some frustration. God, there may be greed or, 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 or covet. God, I don't, I don't know what sits in this room. I know what sits in my heart. God, I guess my biggest prayer for your church this morning is that we would not be complacent in our sin. God, that we wouldn't be complacent with something that openly grieves you and your spirit. But that, God, we would deal with it, that we would seek your face. And as a fruit of that, God, you would hear our prayer. You would forgive our sins and you would heal our land. Make that our prayer this morning. We're weak, but your spirit is strong in us. In Jesus' name.